Well, thank you very much, everyone. We're so happy to have Elizabeth Povinelli here with us, not coming from that far or for far enough or sort of weird far. And Philippa Ramos also, very well known also here. Uh, for, for me, it's very exciting to go back why we're doing affirmations in this school, in the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, Preservation. And the reason why we started is actually these two squares. I was telling now Elizabeth and, and Philippa about this. There's a stream that runs underneath this stage or whatever we call it, this theater. But architecture has done so many efforts to, to kind of avoid, to acknowledge that there's water running underneath and it's been running for, for longer than the school existed. Uh, we actually need five pipes to prevent this room to, from flooding. And I dream that one day we can have the water here and we can keep celebrating events like this and affirmations with the water without the need of an architecture that denies our interconnection with water and streams and many other things and pumps that fail. So hopefully we can soon get the water back and at one point that would make affirmations much stronger. But we're affirming what is possible. The affirmation sessions are intended to affirm what grows what lives in through us beyond the cracks of the very thin and, and sinking worlds of extractivism, liberal capitalism, coloniality, racialization, patriarchates, carbonization, anthropocentrism, ableism, and technocracy. Uh, there's so many things that are growing through this, as opposing to this, uh, in the cracks of this, uh, kind of ignoring them. Uh, when we talk about ecology and the built environment, it is often understood that for architecture, urbanism, design, ecology means sustainability, leads certificates, carbon calculations, somehow an, accept, an extension of the modern world to incorporate new problems that technology and optimization will make disappear. But ecology is something that can be very different, something that means something very different that, re, that basically redefines what architecture, what urbanism can be. Today's session is called Ecological Entanglements. That comes actually from a previous conversation that, that you, Elizabeth and Philippa, you had right in the past. Uh, Elizabeth Povinelli is massively contributed to experience, to sense what ecology is now, and so does Philippa. So it's kind of a privilege to have you here continuing this conversation. Elizabeth, in your work, in your many forms of work and, and through the many collective entanglements, your work happens as Ecology lives in the mess where togetherness and interdependency multiply and deepen the terrain of the possible. Depends like going deep, right? You often say that, and you were repeating that before. Present and past times, bureaucracy, anger, ancestral spirits, deontologies, uh, iPhones, Trump, tides, uh, night fire, morning tea, uh, agricultural future, just to mention a few of the things that, that you put together, articulate their consistence to your work, and you, you acknowledge that, and you work making that uh, something that we can sense and, and creating togetherness uh, uh, through them. And Philippa, uh, you've been in conversation with Elizabeth for a long time, uh, and your, your uh, similar uh, uh, text, What the Virus Wants, has helped us also understand what a pandemic is, what, what, what we're living through now, and what spatial practices, compositional practices mean now. I actually remember very well when we curated together the Shanghai Biennale, Philippa, and we brought the work of Caroline Thong Collection. Uh, these amazing uh, two films, Bhutan and Primary, I'm not saying it, uh, Wood Tower, or, well, probably <laughs> Salt Water Dreams. Uh, such a beautiful film, and the Jealous One, and I remember long lines of very young people uh, kind of spending hours watching these films and how, how basically moving it was for everyone to see ancestors and, and kind of bureaucracy coming together and two iPhones. Uh, writing about, again, Jipel, Jipel, you say? Uh, both a coastal tidal creek in Northern Australia and a girl dressed as a young man lying face down, rather it is to prove that what happens, and you, you ask something that I, I love when you write about Jipel, Rather, it is to prove what happens when we ask the question of how variations, how various modes of existence can establish or maintain their normative force in a world. I think this is kind of a great beginning for a conversation like this that I hope we can con con continue for a long time in, here in this room with the, with the stream, with the water, with our practices, with many people around your work and your conversation. 
The session of affirmations is introduced uh, by Barjan Polman, then Elizabeth, you will give a talk and then you will engage in conversation that we will open also to our planetary cohort and to the audience here. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Andres, and, and welcome everyone. Welcome again, I should say, to, to what is already uh, now our eighth um, affirmation. Time really flies, um, and it's really, really wonderful to welcome Is Elisabeth Povinelli here tonight with um, Filippa Ramos for an affirmation that we titled, as you can see, and as was mentioned, um, Ecological Entanglements, which indeed actually comes uh, from an earlier interview that Philippa had with, with Elizabeth and that we think captures so well um, what will be at stake in the conversation um, here tonight and will likely reveal also some interconnections with earlier affirmations. I see Mireya here, affirmation two on material ecologies, for example. I, I think these threats really start to, to emerge right now. Um, and as of those, uh, as those of you uh, who have attended other affirmations know, um, as always, I want to welcome not, not only you here present in the room, um, but also all of you who join us remotely um, on GSEP's YouTube channel, um, and especially the members of our planetary cohort of respondents who are, um, as in the previous seven affirmations, um, joining us across many different continents and time zones to, to follow these conversations. So good night, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening <laughs> to all of you. Um, my name is Bartjan Polman. I'm the Director of Exhibitions and Public Programming here at Columbia GSEP. Um, and as many of you know, and uh, as Andres um, also just, just explained, um, we developed affirmations really as a project to, to interrogate and to affirm how to think and practice the reworlding of societies and ecosystems now. Societies and ecosystems emerging from the various cracks that start to appear within the multiple mm. structures of power on which our current world is built. Um, so Affirmations is very much also a, a project about possible, about possible worlds. And of course, Elizabeth, your, world, uh, your work extensively deals uh, with such, such possible worlds. And in fact, uh, when we were putting together this series, I think your name was one of the first ones um, uh, to, to, to come up. Um, and the collection of essays that, that Eflux published, I have a copy here under the title Routes Worlds, um, precisely deals with, with the creation and the mm. dismantling of worlds. So there's a lot of, of overlap um, uh, here, dealing with, with the dead dialectic of liberal capitalism, and in doing so provides, mm. as, as the blurb on the back states, um, both weapons as well as inspiration. Mm. Um, and since we are in a school of architecture, I also want to emphasize how fundamentally spatial um, a lot of your, your thinking is, and for me, and I might be biased um, as an architect, but, but the returning notion or, or metaphor rather of the seal in your work, I ah. find incredibly um, <laughs> powerful, whether it's through, um, let's say, the explanation of, of Brexit or Trump as an attempt at, at sealing the tubes um, through which a global post-national elite sort of maneuvers around the planet, or uh, in a slightly more optimistic sense, the notion of of sealing as it emerges from your interest um, in developing an anthropology of the otherwise um, that locates itself, and I quote you, within forms of life that are at odds with dominant and dominating modes of being, end of quote. And in what you call, I really love this word, the, the ambagination um, of space, for example, gift economies, one, one such possible world, are understood as being able to, to, to close a world but never mm. seal it, um, let's say creating access and deficits um, simultaneously. Um, and this, this spatiality sort of keeps repeating um, in, in, in the Routes World uh, book. Routes figure space, they create worlds, routes configure things in 3D manifestations, and things then that are to be understood broadly from container ships to societies and from linguistic forms to social institutions. And you give this example, this, this well-known example of, the, of the, the Panama Canal in the book, basically, not, alter, not only altering the landscape um, of, mm. of the canal, but also redesigning shipping itself, mm. etc. Um, and lastly, Possible Worlds, of course, also um, resonates with, with Elizabeth's um, seminal work as a founding member of the Carabing film collection. It was already mentioned. Uh, and the word uh, Carabing in, in the Amerigal um, language refers to a form of collectivity, and, and I quote again, outside of government imposed strictures or clanship or land ownership. And of quote, and for those of you again who joined us for the last session, there's some resonances mm. here between uh, with what Eyal uh, Weitzman mm. and David Wengrow 
uh, were talking about in their Nebelivka hypothesis. Um, and I'm also really honored uh, to have one of the foremost authorities, <laughs> I would say, um, on Elizabeth's work here with us tonight. <laughs> this is, of course, Philippa work. Ramos, um, <laughs> who's, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> in her own work. In her, yes, <laughs> and, and her own work, no, but yes. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, Filipa Ramos, whose own work um, as a writer and curator extensively deals with the intersection uh, between technology and nature and the urgent and much needed um, need to move away from, from anthropocentrism um, in the arts and, and, and beyond, I would say. And, and like I said, you're an expert on, Felisa, Philippa's, uh, on Elizabeth's work, which you have included in various projects, um, including the, the incredible, really incredible, and I highly recommend it to everyone, uh, multi-year interdisciplinary um, festival and research projects called The Shape of a Circle in the Mind of a Fish. Um, so, so please, if you haven't heard about it, please go check it out, um, which you, you developed, Filippa, together with Lucia Petrodrusti um, for the Serpentine Gallery's General um, Ecology Project. Um, so a few words about the, the format uh, tonight, which slightly differs um, from other sessions. Um, so for, first we'll hear um, Elizabeth speak for about 30, 40 minutes, um, which will be followed by, by a conversation, roughly the, the same for the same length of time um, before we open it up to, to, to questions. And we should be done around 8, 8.15 uh, New York City time. Um, so both um, Elizabeth and Philippa's phenomenal uh, biographies can be read and found in all their detail uh, online, but I I'll briefly mention a few uh, highlights. Um, Elizabeth Povinelli is the Franz Boas uh, Professor of Anthropology and Gender Studies at Columbia here, um, where she has also been the Director of the Institute for Research on Women and Gender and the Co-Director of the Center for the Study of Law and Culture. She's a founding member of the Caribbean Film Collective, uh, and Povinelli's academic work has focused on developing a critical theory of settler late liberalism and its aftershocks. Um, she deals with these thematics as the author of many, many incredible books, um, but has also explored similar thematics in a series of artworks shown in galleries and museums and through the medium of film, of course, uh, with her Caribbean colleagues. Uh, and, and we have um, uh, developed uh, already eight, I think, uh, award-winning uh, films. Um, Philippa Ramos is a writer and curator and a research manifested in many different mediums as well, um, focuses on how culture addresses ecology, attending um, to how contemporary art fosters relationship between nature and technology. Um, she's the curator of the Art Basel film sector and the founding curator, curator of the online artist cinema Feedrome and is the curator of many, many exhibitions and just to name two, the Catalan represa representation um, at this year's Venice Art Biennial. Um, and in 2021, it was already uh, mentioned, um, she co-curated Body of Waters, the 13th Shanghai Biennial, together with Andres Hake, um, Lucia Pietrudrusti, uh, Marina otero Feche, and Mi Yu. Um, she's also a prolific editor and publisher and was editor-in-chief of Eflux Criticism and contributed to several documentas. And her upcoming book, The Artist as Ecologist, will be published this, this year. Um, I also want to thank this uh, opportunity to, uh, to thank Clarissa, uh, and, and Callum in the back who are, are helping us everything with everything tonight and our, our AV team, of course, Kane, uh, Shannon and, and Marcio. Um, so with that, let us get ready to maybe untangle some entanglements. Um, the floor <laughs> is yours. <laughs> yeah. Make them worse. <laughs> yeah. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to start since we don't have tons of uh, time. Um, uh, and I'm going to start in May of 2023 when sev uh, seven members of Cotterbang, um, uh, uh spent a week in my ancestral village, Corzolo, located in the upper Sarka uh, River at the foot of Val Genova and in the shadow of the Dolomites. So I was there, uh, uh, Cecilia Lewis, Natasha Bigfoot Lewis, this is Katrina Bigfoot Lewis, Cameron Bionamu, and two of our little ones, um, who I call great grandkids, um, Kaina Lewis, who was about four, and uh, uh, Acadia uh, Lewis Lee, who was about nine. We were also there with my cousin, Ivo Povinelli, but from a different clan, and I'll, that'll make sense 
later. Karabing, we were in my village because we were traveling around. Uh, we went to uh, Austria, we went to Vienna, then Munich, and then down to, <laughs> it was a great trip, Venice, then up to Corisol, then down to Naples and up to Rome. We were just moving around various exhibitions. And we wound up in Rome um, to talk with the uh, director of the Museo della uh, Cilvalta in Roma um, uh, about a project that they're supporting called Melting Glaciers, Rising Tides, which in Karabing we sometimes call the Two Clans Project. Whatever we call this project, sometimes melting glaciers, rising tide, sometimes we call it that salt water and that, that, that glacier, sometimes we call it, you know, depending who's talking, your country, our country, right? Your country, Beth, our country, or y'all's country, my country, right? So we call it all kinds of things. Whatever we call the project, what it attempts to do is to interpret the history of the present of my ancestral lands in Corizola um, and more broadly in the region of Trentino, uh, Italy, which now Italy, which is just uh, below the Dolomite Alps, and to interpret it from a Cotabing perspective, to read the history of this place and the history of the present of this place from a Cotabing point of view. Now, you, I was, didn't know if I, we'd introduce Karabing for those of you who don't. These are a bunch of slides from our, some of our films. I realized I should have put the names on them, but I didn't. Sorry about that. Um, those who don't know Karabing, um, uh, Karabing is a, uh, it's a artistic research group who primarily is known for our film work. Um, Karabing is an Emmy angle term, so, and I'll say what it means, but Emmy or Emmy angle is one of the languages of several and an area of several um, along the coast in what's now called Anson Bay, which you know you'll see, uh, uh, it's a, 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 that composes the lands and languages of the Cotabing group. Cotabing itself doesn't refer to any particular place or any particular language group, even though it is an Emmy term. It, it refers to the state of a tide. So when the tides in this coastal area are the furthest out, we say it's Karabing, and they're set to come back. And when they're up the furthest, we say Karakal, they're set to go back out. So it's a, it's a term that refers to a coast that connects these lands. But it's also a concept. And it's a concept that hopefully you'll see a little bit how it functions. It's a concept that says, while different members of Karabing pick up different parts of this coastal country, the emphasis is on the fact that those coastal lands are in the shape they're in, in the form they're in, with the language they're in, because of the way they were formed through connections with other country. And the, I'll pull this out more. But Karabing is a concept that says, that pivots against Western understandings of property and proprietariness. Um, the other thing to know about Karabing is that uh, it, it is primarily a, an attempt to produce forms of relationality that are decolonizing, right? So rather than an aesthetic practice, we could say it's an aesthetic practice. It tries to create and, and reaffirm and support bodies oriented to a decolonizing project. Um, so this is basically where we were um, and where we were coming from. Uh, in the project that we're doing, this Rising Tides Melting Glaciers, it pulls together this area in Italy with an area in Australia, and it seeks to use two conditions of water to examine how and whether 
the ongoing nature of differential colonial sedimentations are being altered in the context of contemporary climate shift and green energy imaginaries. So the glaciers in the in Cortisolo and other uh, villages in the the Italian Alps, as these start melting, and the tide starts tides are rising in Caribbean country on the coast. What are the ways in which the entanglements of these waters help us to see how these historical colonial relations are or aren't being addressed. So it's a relational project. I'm really happy to have Felipe here because she and Lucia invited me to do a video which in some ways, in some ways, one of the ways you could, it was 2020 and they said, you know, would you do a video for the shape of, of a circle in the mind of a fish? And I said, well, we're, we're beginning to think about this project about rising tides, melting glaciers. Um, so in that project, I brought together in a little video, three conditions of water, rising tides in Australia, melting glaciers in in uh, the, what are now the Italian Alps, where my family came from with their grandparents, and freshwater and deserts in the US, where we went. And we'll come back to that. Um, now, the underlying, if we say, well, we're interested in, Cotterbing's interested in reading the history of a particular place, that is my ancestral place. Um, from the perspective of their country and the history of their country. Uh, and if we wound up in Cortisolo in 2023, the project of rising tides, melting glaciers, or fresh water, frozen water, salt water, which are the three forms of water, really, that, that we live in, um, it didn't, the project didn't start in 2023 when we got to Cortisolo, right? It actually emerged nearly 40 years ago um, when I first arrived at Bellune in 1984. Uh, just, I want to give a quick summary of wh where, what Bellune is, where it is. Um, uh, it's the home of uh, most Karabing, um members of the Karabing Film Collective. Uh, but in a very quick way, Bellune was, uh, began as an internment camp, uh, originally called Delisseville in the 1930s. So what you're seeing here is a photo of Delisseville um, in 1938. Uh, and it was this period is when a very small, it, what was really a small uh, 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 population of settlers were, were, who had arrived only in 1869. So Darwin wasn't literally settled until 1869. By 1930, it was still a very small population of, of primarily white, but also Chinese uh, migrants the 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 in the 30s the the settler government decided that it was going to start controlling the indigenous population by forcibly interning people into onto camps both uh christian mis missionaries catholic and other kinds of christians and government settlements and belia was a government settlement that took the ancestors of Cotterbing and forced them into um into the into the middle of the Cox Peninsula, which is just across the harbor from, uh, well, you can't see it here, just across the harbor there. But you see that pink dot? That's Bellewin. And Darwin's just to the east, and it was started in the 1930s. Now, so for from the 1930s to 1976, when the land rights, Federal Land Rights Act was passed in 1976, um, all uh, 
the, the movement, the, 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 the work life, the marriage and intimacy life, all aspects of indigenous um, men and women were controlled under various uh, wards of the state acts, right? So from really, and this started in the 19, 1905, but 1905, 1910, 1915, then in the 1930s when people were forcibly um, jailed um, in internment camps, all aspects of indigenous life worlds were controlled by the state. And it was only in, in 1967 that in Australia that a referendum was passed that allowed, that told the federal government it had to count the indigenous population. And then one thing, and then the other thing that, that the federal government could, had the right to pass special legislation about indigenous people. So in 1976, they passed the first big a uh, piece of national legislation called the Land Rights Act of 1976, uh, which was the, it, the, it, the settler Australia lauded themselves, praised themselves for finally recognizing the fact that indigenous people had what they, the, the settler state said were proprietary relations to their country. So the state celebrated, the settler state celebrated the passage as this as this watershed in the colonial state, settler state's recognition of the rights of indigenous people. But of course, all you have to do is read the legislation to notice that the rights of indigenous people were tightly restricted by the legislation that outlined the conditions by, under which people could make a claim for their own land, right? And there were these very conservative anthropological models. Um, after the, this Land Rights Act was passed, uh, all communities uh, that had been government settlements or religious settlements uh, uh, reverted to an indigenous name. So Delisville became Belluan on the, and on the basis of a water hole in the back where a, th this ancestral uh, man Bell Ewan uh, uh, lives and plays a didgeridoo for uh, folks. So in 1984, we could say the Rising Tides Melting Glaciers project started. Why? Because the women and men that I met and began a conversation with me that basically was like, where are, where are you from, white lady? Like, young lady, where are you from? So I'm like 21. And again, I'm not an anthropologist. I'm just, I'm a, I had a degree in philosophy. So it wasn't like, you know, informant thing. It was just like, they were like, where have you washed up to our shore? Where did you come from? Right, you have, you have an accent like Elvis, but you, isn't that a, an Italian name? <laughs> so what are you, Elvis or Italy, right? And I was like, look, don't, don't start with Italy, oh my God. And I described to them when they're asking, like, where, how, where, you know, yes, another white person washed up on the shore. Where did you come from? And I started describing to them my, what my parents, what my father, I should say, father and his parents drilled into my head and my siblings' head that I've discussed in the inheritance, which is a, this, these are some pages from it. And what they drilled into our heads were, you. We are Simonaz Povnelli. Simonaz, we say Skatum in dialect up in the mountains. You are Simonaz po Povnelli. And all Povnellis emerge from this village in the, f in f literally in the 1400s, right? And they were like, you know, and Corizol, and it was an argument, Corizol, Corizolo. The German pronunciation, the more Italian pronunciation. Um, and what they also emphasized was that Corisolo was a, was a, this a small village within the Carta de Regula system. And the Carta system, there's a book, there's a lot of books on it. The Carta system was a system that was started as the Roman Empire like collapsed from 1027 and it ended in 1805 when Napoleon liberated us from our feudal ways. 
and in which the prince bishop down in Trento said to all these little communities up in the, you know, in the fringes of the Alps, you know what, I have enough problems. You guys can make your own rules for how you uh, uh, govern your common lands. I have ultimate authority, but you can make the rules, right? And these rules were based on the Cini families, families from there, and their Icampini, their their bounded bounded land. And what so so this mode of commoning went on for like eight hundred years. And in eighteen oh five uh, Napoleon came in and freed us from feudalism, dispossessing families in this area from their family based governance. Right? Now the, we can see there's like the, the archive, if you do the archive from this area, it's easy to see when Poven Povenelli emerges as a nickname in like 1480 or something. This little guy, Bartomeleo, detto, Poinelli, which means cheese, little cheese. So little cheese guy. And then as this carta system progresses, these nicknames, nobody had surnames, these nicknames became uh, uh, surnames so that you could know who was inside the commune and who was outside. So it was i vicini, i forestieri, the strangers, so us and them. All right. Uh, right. Now, as our uh, conversations progressed, so, you know, it's 1984 and it's 1985, and, you know, we just keep talking, and this has been going a long time. But in those first couple of years, as our conversations progressed, I actually found real, I was like, wow, I was li with my family. I had never, other than my Povinelli family and my Ambrosi family, and my, my father's mother, I had never heard people talking about relations to country that sounded like my family, right? And it was relations based on, uh, like, family-based relations, like who are the families for this area, who are the families for that area, but also more than human relations. Um, for instance, they would say, do, does, if your family is like from there, do you guys, what, or do you belong to like different place? I said, yeah, Corizolo, Pinzolo. And they said, no, 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 like in there, are there like, do you have names for places in your mountains, right? And so I said, oh yeah, well before, Sure, I mean, before they, at least my grandparents say that there were, there are these named rock area. And we, I'm sure you can't read the Italian, but according to, you know, my grandparents and older people in Cortisolo, Pinzola, and otherwhere, in the, during the Council of Trent, the Council of Trent exiled all, and of course they called these witches and devils, they exiled all the witches and devils into the area right behind Cortisolo, my village, right? And those whatever witches and devils had always been able to transform themselves into rock and untransform themselves into rock. Right, so, and on the on the this side, it's a, it talks about a chiata de Gaul, which is in in dialect, um, which sits in the has sat it sat in the it was erratic and it sat in the valley and if it sees Christians coming it runs and it tells the head of this guy like they're coming and so they organize to block the Christians from there, and according to Council of Trent and the and then the Catholics is that God froze them solid, right? So they can't move anymore, right? But they're still there. They're in the place, they have the names. And, you know, so I'm like, blah, 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 blah. And when I started talking about that, they started talking about, oh yeah, the ways in which they, their country was formed on the basis of the movement of various ancestral creatures. So the, the country's shape itself is the transformation of the bodies of various 
ancestors that moved around the country. For example, and I'll do it easy because we talked about Carter being, and we talk about this example a lot. Um, a barramundi fish, which maybe some of you have eaten. I don't know. Um, there were two barramundi fish. Uh, see the dot in the middle? There are two sisters, and they went around and around. There are two sisters. They went around and around, and they're bickering. They're still bickering. And they're bickering in the, the, in the area out, just outside this huge, what is now there, it's this huge estuarine creek. And they bicker, 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 bicker. Um, and they finally said, you know what? This is crazy. We'll just split up and each one go our own way. So one went to the west and laid down in that little area here, laid down, and it created a coastal point in its shape and it's called Mobiluk. And so it's there, it's at Mobiluk. The other one went that way, kind of east, south, southeast, and it actually created the big river that now exists there, this Eastern Creek that exists there. And as the women said this, they were like, you know, they were saying, you know, so are your, are these Chata de Gaulle still both where they are now and where they were before? And I was like, uh, well, no, if they, w I think if they were here and then went there, then they're there, right? They said no, because like in our country, the relationality means that two sisters made three places, and to think about those fish, you need four fish, right? So you have two going, because they're all still there. They didn't come from there, leave, and go somewhere else. They're still there, so you have two in the center, you have one over at Mabuluk, and you have one over at wherever the other one is up the river, right? So a whole different topography of relationality unfolds when we're not thinking about where did you, where did you come from in the sense of a ra radici or an origin, right? Where are you from, right? I'm from Cordiolo. But rather, where did you come from? so that you ended up here, but you're also still over there. You see what I mean? You're also still up there. You're still going around in a circle, but you're also here. And thus what the women were asking me while we sat there wasn't a question of origins. It wasn't a question of radici, right? What they were asking me, and it, and it wasn't let's compare Corizolo to Bellion. That's not what they were asking me. They were asking me, and also they weren't saying like, what's the ontology, what's the relational ontology of your wall, here's the relational ontology of ours. It wasn't an ontological project, it wasn't a comparative project, it wasn't a, a, a origins project. It was a question about if you are from there, why did you wash up here? And how in washing up here are you, no matter where you're from, part and parcel of the same repetition of certain people moving and certain people not? And not only people moving here, but our country going over there. So it was, in the beginning, a question of relationality. Um, and again, my social form, no matter, you know, I could say, well, I come from, I come from Cortisolo, and literally Povinelli's came out of the ground from there. We have these more than human uh, uh, forms of being that break the geontological imaginary. Nevertheless, how, if in my Povinelli family, and I'm Barosi family, there was this discourse of Napoleonic dispossession. You know, we, had, we, we, we were, you know, the Vicini from there for 800 years, and Napoleon, he dispossessed us, all right? Which is, which is what they said in my family. If we were dispossessed, like they were dispossessed, again, why did these different forms of movement occur? And why did 
do different kinds of bodies emerge? The short, of course, is that, and it's something that won't surprise any of us, um, hopefully in this room, is that we weren't dispossessed in the same, we don't, no matter how much, when we sat down together in 1984, still today, the feeling of like, oh my God, there's nobody, like how you guys think about your world feels so close to me. Nevertheless, we do not share dispossession, and that's a crucial part of the Cotterbing methodology. What do we mean by that? It's simple. When it's something that many people have said it by this point, when my family was dispossessed by Napoleon, we were dispossessed into possessive individualism. We were dispossessed into being the kind of human that was afforded the, quote, right to take to both begin to own things, to own ourselves as individuals, to own c land and country, which we could not do. It was, it was econfine, it was bounded, but no one in these communes owned the land. You owned the right to make decisions about how it was used. But when we were dispossessed, we could also take advantage of other people's dispossession. So, went by 1869 when my great grandfather was born and as he grew up he started moving from Corisolo which was very poor people starving all over the place and go to Buffalo the lands of Seneca why because he could take advantage of a different kind of dispossession a more radical dispossession the kind of dispossession that Cotterbane lived under right so in this very first conversation, and I, what you're seeing here, sorry, uh, although my grand, I know, those who don't know this poster, although my grandparents and my father could, in their own mind, said that we were dispossessed w the way Native Americans were dispossessed. No, absolutely not. On the, but, but this idea of a shared dispossession is extraordinarily important right now in Europe in general and definitely in this area where I am. But the return to this notion of we also had our indigenous traditions, we were also dispossessed by capitalism, liberalism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Christianity. We need to go back and look at our, uh, look at our ancient commoning traditions is a widespread discourse across Europe, right? So this poster is uh, from Lega Nord, which is now just Lega, which is a very conservative party in, it was first just up in the, um, in the north, and now it's a national, really a national party in, in Italy, claims that if, you know, they don't keep out migrants, then they will become like Native Americans, but they are also using this idea that, well, we, 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 we are indigenous. We are indigenous. We had our own country. On the, on the other side, of course, is during the same period, the way indigenous people in Australia are being treated under this, this sex panic and this new piece of legislation that came out in 2007 that imposed a whole new set of surveillance tactics on indigenous folks. So, the project that we're trying to do really is trying to look at the way in which this, this, the emergence of a, uh, a, a, throughout Europe, it's different in the U.S. and it's the interesting thing about the difference here, a, a movement, an atmosphere, both on the right and the left, very different politics, but atmospherically similar to return to an indigenous Europe, often with that fr term used, you know. We had our own traditions. Um, and I think this turn toward a European indigeneity, right, right a white indigeneity or something, European, turn toward like, you know, no, we have our own culture, um, uh, 
isn't doesn't show that the decolonizing a decolonial critique uh, failed. I think it shows the success of the, the decolonizing critique. It's not what we wanted, but it's an, it's an interesting success. Why? Because suddenly, to have value, you have to, and it's a weird inversion. We'll get to. It. You have to believe that you have your own relation to a country. Right? Now, this is interpreted as a, a radici, as a root. You have to have a root, right? A root, and. We really, I have to say, Cotterbing, we confronted this not in 2023, but in this was 2018 when uh, four of us went to Cortisol. This was prior to the trip. It was me and Sunta, uh, uh, Rex Singh and Linda Yerowen and um, uh, Aiden, Aiden Singh. And, you know, we we're looking, they were like, we don't know if you've just invented this country. We're going to go and check it out and make sure you're not just bullshitting. Um, and so we went there, and they were like, oh. And, but the genealogist said, since you're here, can you help us understand your clan? Because your clan pulled out of the village after the First World War. So I'm sitting there showing, doing this genealogy. This is Linda over here. Linda's like going, oh my God, they're doing to you what they did to us. Why are they doing that? And I said, oh, that's a good question. Why are they doing it? And what we heard were we're trying to, you know, we don't want to steal other people's culture. We want to return to our own. Okay, return to our own. What you're going to see here is just a series of pictures in which We've been trying to, I've been trying to, we've been trying to think about what, how would visually we think about this movement of returning to one's own uh, from a Cotterbing perspective. And this first image was a long time ago in which we were trying to think about not how to think about time from a Cotterbing perspective, not past, present, future, but the continual recycling of activity into the soil and then out of the soil. So that sedimentation itself becomes history. I mean, there's no history other than in the ground that you're making. Um, then we started trying to sketch out, I can't see with my glasses, what this might look like temporally so that, oh, I don't know, like here's in, in which there's always, um, uh, a knot between places, although the knot looks more like that. So there's all this kind of spooky action at a distance. Like, how do you say what's happening over in Cortisol? It's related to Cotterbing in the 1700s, right? Would have to be spooky action at a distance as the boats go over and start gutting um, the, 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 what comes to be called the Americas, right? And then try to find other routes up into Southeast Asia and Asia under mercantilism, right? And that floods into Europe, creating a crescendo of populations that then in my, in the Alps, all these villages start getting more and more inconvenient to try and like seal off their borders. Um, how does that relate to the boats that are then sailing over to uh, across the north of, of Australia, seeding disease, seeding forms of settler colonialism, et cetera. And how do we show that over time so that you're never thinking you can go back into your roots, but any root, any radici you go into is always itself this relational world. Um, this is something I did for uh, Arge and, and um, Balzan in which it was, I liked it, it was like crayon in which again, it's like, how do you, maybe this is a temporal diagram, but how do you see every moment as this, this form of nodding that doesn't work in a cause effect of relation anymore, but really is materially more um, spooky action as a distance. Then we, uh, we started trying to, this is my, uh, the cortisolo side of the, the ground in which the ground itself, it becomes 
the, the object of, of investigation in which you're trying to think about how was this built out um, over time as these folks hemorrhage out. Um, or this is in Museo della Roma where we did a show um, in which we're trying to think again on this side, like here's the ancestral catastrophe of the boats uh, invading, um, uh, invading across the Atlantic and Pacific, so the kind of shared ground, but then the ramification of that catastrophe only working relationally across these, across these fields. Um, so in Australia, it's terra nullius in, um, under the, the, the viciousness of enslavement, it's code noir, it's uh, uh, various kinds of treaties, it's a differential of toxic accumulations and et cetera. And then we started thinking, okay, what if we just really tried to create a image that worked sedimentationally in which the center would be things happening in a kind of, I don't know, general way and then the spooky sedimentational effects as you look at one place or another because again from a cottery perspective you're never looking at anything abstractly you're always looking from somewhere to some place right but you have to look in such a way that you don't ever agree that the way things are related is under the mindset of a cause, cause and effect, because that would be a Western epistemology. Um, and then finally, and we'll, I'll stop here, finally, in the now moment, in the contemporary moment, we're trying to think about, again, these relations of um, water, frozen water, fresh water, salt water. And in particular, the, the ways in which the use of the more than human world uh, allows for the relational accumulation of value in these two places. So on, the, this, on this side of the, this, the map is, you can see cortisol is up here somewhere. Where's cortisol over there? There's Valgenova. Um, there's Pinzolo. Cortisol is on the other side of Pinzolo. In the 1950s, there was this, this huge engineering project to divert water from Val Genova and up in the, the Alps down over, you can see down over to uh, the Mul uh, Mulvena uh, as a storage place and then down to the Guarda in a, in a way that would power energy. So it was, a, it was a power system, but also an agricultural system. So they could take all the water um, and use it to, for agriculture and use it to generate power. Um, and it was in this moment, it was the engineering was this grand idea of modernity and man controlling nature and harnessing it. And now, of course, as the, the glaciers are melting, there's not enough water. There's not enough water for energy. There's not enough water for agriculture and there's not enough water for skiing, right? So there's a shift um, in the north to say, okay, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have solar power and we're gonna shift from a ski economy to a, you know, sports tourist economy. Um, so we're gonna climb the rocks of, that have the, the frozen bodies of Chasta de Gaulle. And we're gonna say, they're the frozen bodies of Chateau de Gaulle, isn't that cool? So we're gonna sell the, what's the, understood to be nothing but a myth to create a new economy. And of course, from a Cotterbing point of view, what you're seeing as this area, as the snow melts and the water dries up, what you see from Cotterbing when you say, oh, when, when in Corisolo and Tirolago and the other places, when they say, oh, this is great, we're gonna have green energy, we're gonna have sports, Cotterbing says, uh-oh, here they come again. Because where is the material for the green energy coming from? As per always, it's gonna come from the places that have already been designated as zones 
of poverty or abandonment, right? And in in Karabing territory over here, right? There's the again that's the Cox Peninsula over here. There was a um, a white paper that came out and has predicted that in 50 years the north of Australia will be uninhabitable. Of course, it will be uninhabitable to settlers, right? But it will still be inhabited by Karabing and other indigenous people. But that's saying that it is going to be an, an uninhabitable means that th there's more justification for using it as an extraction zone to create the infrastructure for the places in which, from which settlers came to continue to be inhabitable and economic. Voila. Thank you. Thank you so much for opening up these relationalities and temporalities and, and access to those, um, showing who has access to these as well. I would like to open it up, um, Philippa, to, to, to start Thank the conversation. Um, it's, it's also so incredible because the, these images are, are very powerful anchors and they're very mm. hypnotic. No? And so, and, but th 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 in this case, they really guided us through, they, they anchored us and they guided us also through the different flows and vectors that, that this, this talk touched upon. And, and for me, and it, it led into so many different directions, mm -hmm. but for me, it really led me to think on the one hand about rights mm. and the invention of rights and uh, who are rights for. Mm. Um, and on the other hand, thinking about land and thinking mm. about land not as a thing, not as a commodity, uh, but as a, a set of relationships. No? And it's really interesting that you you were mentioning you were often uh, using Italian terms, and it's really interesting that if we have the the English term neighbor, mm. the Italian one vicino it means yeah. closeness we're yeah. close vicino means to be close and to be neighbors no yeah. and already shows right. that the land is not so much a thing but um, um, a glue that brings people together and by this together people need to understand how to relate to one another so it's a set of relationships no? and um, and imagining exactly how in 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 the beginning, how you mentioned that um, Karabing's methodologies and Karabing's perspectives could, um, let's say, help us or or, or could launch a, a, a different view mm. on um, on territories on lands that have known um, a history of or that whose history has been so changed. And it's really interesting that you mentioned the the Napoleonic um, invasions and how they broke uh, uh, historical feudal uh, relationships. Of course they did, because by doing that, mm. they managed okay. to change the land from oh. a set of relationships to a commodity mm. that then mm -hmm. can enter mm. into a market and it can be right. alienated. And, and, and of course, this, this seems very obvious, but going back to thinking how a Caribbean perspective and methodology can, can also help you think about um, other places. Um, I, I guess that more than questions, I have responses or, or modes of engaging to, to what you said, and, and hopefully this, this can become a, a more a conversation than a sort mm. of a series of questions. But um, I, I would like to, to start exactly thinking about um, relationships between lands and, and laws which are so bonded into one another. and. Um, by by just wondering how these methodologies and ways of of thinking can also depart from questioning rights, for instance, something that has surprised me constantly. Um, there was one one there's one interview where I don't know if Katrina or Natasha one of them says, mm. well, 
we approached we approached Beth because we we needed an anthropologist to sign our our papers and well uh, she wasn't an anthropologist she was a philosopher but we needed her <laughs> and she became an anthropologist to mm. to validate this no so um, the fact that these um, the, well mm. the Caribbean is a good example but indigenous people still need to conform right. to laws to norms to the rights that were written to oppress them mm. you know mm. and um, and one of them is the fact that they need uh, a discipline that has yes. made so much to um, ha that has made so much to other them and to to study them as as indigenous to validate their own claims no That's right. um, and yeah. so at th at the same time how can this perspective break even the system within which they have to fit how can this how can they follow these rights, for instance, and think about rights and thinking about rights to the land and to their own rights of land, while at the same time challenge these rights, knowing that these rights were mostly written to as white. Not the human is not a yes. universal human, is a white human. Yeah, that's and right. it's a human that is disconnected from the land or for whom the land is. You know, it's a, it's, yeah, that's the conversation that started it. And again, for those of you who don't know, by law, <laughs> indigenous people in Australia, and it was also the case in Canada and the US, cannot represent themselves, um, cannot represent their cultural traditions themselves. They need to be mediated by an anthropologist. That's why I'm one. Because the older folks said, you know, would you, and they need a lawyer and an anthropologist. Would you be a lawyer? I said, oh, please, God, anything else? And they said, anthropologist. And I said, what's that? I've said this story many times. And they said, white people studying us. I mean, they're, they're, nobody was, like, fooled by this. And I was like, what? No, please. And they said, no, we don't want you to study us. We want you to, alongside us, and that's why this project started, what? what? How, ca why can't they understand when they keep on s saying they, they recognize or giving us our rights and we describe to them our relations? They can't hear us, i.e., they can't hear the difference between rights and relations. And in particular, they can't hear, they seem, and I think they could hear fine, but they seem incapable of putting two things, holding two things in a simultaneous frame. I, yeah, like in that, in, in, in Natty, that was Natasha with the, with the fish, and that was Rex Edmonds with the fish on his shoulder. They're from Mobiluk, that's, they pick up Mobiluk through that fish that lay down at Mobiluk. And so people will say, yes, I pick up that country through that fish. But that fish is over down over there too. It's still going around in a circle. And this fish is here because it's over there. Thus, I'm in relation to this one way. I'm in relation to that another way. I'm in relation to that another way. Plus ritual, plus this, plus bliss. It's all relational. It's these entanglements of relation that don't equal a unity. It has a different math. It's incredible. It's like there's, I remember when they first said, how many fish are there? How many fish do you need, Beth? And I was like, two they said no you need four three places two fish four fish right and and what happens is that this idea of rights of course we know this becomes the basis of like napoleon coming over and giving us our rights weren't were to disrupt as was happening throughout the the spaces in which European ships were invading um, was to disrupt relations, to fundamentally turn a complex set of relations into a set of individual rights for some. For some, relations got turned into individual rights. For others, relations were just shattered with the idea that there would no, be no rights coming 
because you would just be gone at a certain point. That would be Karabin, that would be Seneca, where my, my grandparents ended up, right, and Buffalo, Seneca country. Right. So, so the very concept of rights is something that Karabin pushes against. And when it's interpreting uh, the, the move, the European movement toward commons, it's also moving against understanding these as rights, but rather saying, okay, let's, let's understand the, okay, you guys want to go back, and we had these great conversations with people, you guys want to go back and reestablish your relations to co country which is not ethnic and not national. Okay. What are the relations, right? And what are you willing to do and lose and give back to hold on to those relations, right? To the country. The second thing they say is, and are you looking at the, the ancestral present of the country, the ancestral ongoingness of your country? Or are you trying to bypass that ancestral ongoingness by going down into history. What does that mean? It means your country's form, so Cortisolo, all the, the Pinzolo, all of Guastino, tons of them up there. The, the very, uh, the, the wealth of your country right, it was built up out of differential dispossession of other countries. It's simple, right? We know this. So if you're going to reestablish your commons, you have to reestablish them, not going down or not going back into history, but reestablishing them in the actual relations they're in. So if you want to have solar power, where are you getting the stuff from? If you want to, you know, remember that Jack the de Gaulle um, and various other more than human geological formations are your relations, right? And one of these is a Povinelli relation because, well, it's a long story about witches and cheese, but their relations. Are you willing to actually reestablish a relation or are you going to mobilize this as if it was uh, just something else that could go into an economy? Right. So if Karabin is trying to reestablish its relation with its geological ancestors, that means it cannot be in an economy. Right. Are you willing to do that, people in Cortisol and Pinzolo? Are you willing to lose what you feel is your right, and that right is to be comfortable, to look at these multiple relations, relations with other places, relations with the more than human world, and et cetera. Right. If it's only a right, then the, the grindingness of the system will continue on and on. Exactly, and, uh, and I feel that we're very much in this tension because very often there's these conversations about climate change and change and change and change. But all this is changing and there's an awareness, but the fantasies are not changing. Things the desires not are not yeah. changing. That's they right. remain the same. Yeah. And, and that's the problem is that the, the, a large part of, it, of our incapacity is an awareness that the world is changing much faster right. than our own imaginaries right. and right. The, the, our own desires or our own con capacities to conceive how to live. No? Right. Right. And, uh, and this is why it is important to um, to attend to other stories, and and, and, uh, and I'm using other in mm. a non-naive way, stories that we have others, mm. and when I say we, I'm, I'm speaking mm. as a white Western woman, mm. no? um, to, to try to see if in some kind of a, uh, at this point, I don't know if it's a hypnotic or a kind of a repetition process, this, possibility of transformation emerges. But I do think it has to come through a process of, of 
fantasy and storytelling because somehow it was fantasies and mythologies that got us here. Yeah. In the right. sense, right. if if it was possible to write these narratives of segregation, of difference, of separation, of superiority of mm. some in relation mm. to other, based on myths, on myths of uh, even on aesthetic, because some resemble more a certain idea of a god with who was blonde with blue eyes than others, I mm. don't know. Um, it must be also possible to unwrite them mm. and to unwrite other ones. Mm. And, um, and, this, and this is why I think the work that the Carabing is, do that y the Carabing are is doing in telling stories and telling stories that also remember people from Trentino, that their stories are similar, not the, the, the narratives of dispossession, but the fact that this rock that now people are climbing may one day shake and, and shake these people down. No? It's already shaken. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, from, look, it, it, from a carving point of view, the treatment, and the, well, back up, right, two things. They're not, we, Cotterbing does not try and find what's common. And I think this is really important. It's one of the deepest, it's, it's one of the deepest fantasies um, that structure, that continue to structure the relations we're trying to tangle and untangle at the same time. And by that I mean, uh, this drive to find what's common across and often humans, but sometimes humans and non-human, human animals and non-human animals who are busting through the geontological divide, all existence, what's common to it? We search for the common. Why? Because if we can't find what's common among us, well, then we go to war. It's the weirdest thing. I know I'm reducing it. But think about the way in which, you know, our good colleague Butler works. Like, okay, we all share the state of precarity, of vulnerability. All humans. We all come into the world vulnerable, right? And we're born that way. We need the care of others. So we share that. But precarity, or precariousness, I think it is. I can't, I can't remember precarity, which one is which. But anyways, but then that vulnerability is distributed unequally, right? So some people, like Karabing, like, let me tell you, it's distributed, right? People are very comfortable in Cortisolo. It is not comfortable at Bellion. So it's distributed. But this idea that if we could see that we're all you know, ha what we share common, our common, common humanity is vulnerability, then when we look into the other eyes, we say, you are also, you know, and then I grieve you or I don't kill you. We're not, Cotterman doesn't look for commonality, right? We don't look for commonality. And the opposite of commonality is not war, right? It's, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> We think our way is better, but, you know, we would never go and tell you to do it our way because it's your way because it comes out from here, right? So, for instance, many, many, many times we, Cotter Bing would be in a, in a, you know, would be presenting the film, would be on stage here, some of us or whoever, and people would say, do you guys think you're a model for other film collectives, for other indigenous or other film collectives? And everyone would say no. And I always found it really interesting. I was like, <laughs> they were like, are we supposed to say yes? I said, no, we're not supposed to say anything. We're just whatever anybody thinks, we just say. <laughs> when, when were there rules in Gotterbing? Um, but then once we were in Berlin, and it was me and Gavin and Rex Edmonds who was with the fish. And someone asked the same question, do you guys see yourself as a model? And Rex said yes. Uh, my head almost flew off. And I was really curious what he would say. And he said, we are a model because we started doing films. We keep doing films because people 
in want to do them, so they come and do it. And in doing the films, we're actually creating bodies oriented toward country and each other, these particular kinds of relational. The films, in the practice of making them, practice a relationality. And then, as an artifact, to actually show the relationality that we can see. And so, our model is whatever works for you, you should do that, <laughs> right? It, you know, it might not be a film, maybe it's like, oh, well, I don't know, maybe it's going camping or something. So, I just thought it was a br brilliant Cotterbeam way of seeing things. It's like, it's not a model in this is the answer, it applies to everyone at all times, everywhere. And here I'm quoting Vine Deloria's critique of. Western forms of revelation. You get a revelation and you say in the West, ah, I have to reveal to me what the world is. And then you go around and you force people to have the same revelation. Versus Cotter being, it's like, oh, okay, what's happening here? How do I adjust? How far is here? Right? I don't know how far, we don't know where that other fish went. Kind of went over there, we don't know. Does this help you over there think your thing? No? Okay, that's cool, right? So it's an opening of conversation. So when we go to Corizolo, everyone says, okay, well, so th these rocks, these rocks that people are climbing on, they're like your ancestors? <laughs> How does that work, <laughs> right? And people are like, well, it's, a, it's just the fable. Right, so my cousin Evo, God bless, he's from a Metio, he's a different clan, very, we, we could actually probably marry, even though we're both Bovinelles, even though I'm not marrying a guy. But if it was a whole other world, <laughs> then I don't exist in. But when we sat down, we were sitting down in this, in, up by the old sawmill, and I said, Evo, nobody believes me, just, can you tell them the old story about how Povinelli's came from the cheese story and the Chateau de Gaulle stuff. And so he said, oh, yeah, I have some. But, you know, they're just fiabe. Yeah, they're just fiabe, miti, imiti. I was like, why do you start like that? Why are you starting like that? They were like, what did he say? I said, he says they're a bunch of myths. And then Natty and Katrina, of course, said, and Celia was there, they said, oh, so he thinks ours are just myths. I said, well, it might also be, I said, so what do you say, Evo? And he said, what do they say? I said, they want to know if you think their country is just nothing but myth. And, he, and no, but it was good. He was like, oh, right, right. So, so like the conversation doesn't insist, but it says, like why are, like what's going on here? And then more, Fundamentally, Cotterbing says, you know, you're basing all this on, the, on this long history in the West of, well, this is me, ontology and epistemology that turns into fact, right, and modes of science and being. And then fact gets opposed to, and this is very sketchy, but fact gets opposed to myth and legend, right? And then anthropology says, okay, but there are those who, the ones we, we study are the ones who still live in the myth, right? And in the emergence of the 70s across the globe, definitely in settler colonialism, there was supposedly this shift in which the state was like, oh no, now we celebrate that you live in the f myth. It, and indeed, we insist that you show us that you still live in the myth. But the settler state remained in the fact world, right? But the condition of you getting your land back was that you performed that you live in the enchanted world, even though it's not affecting us at all, right? So that was the thing. And meanwhile, of course, Cotter being in their parents and great, and and, and grandparents were like, can't you see <laughs> that if you fuck with your country ancestors, they will go underground, they will be transformed, they won't go away, but they will be transformed, and thus you will be, 
because it's a relation. You change the river, you change. You change the rocks, how they use the rocks, you change. Right? You turn it all into an economy, the economy unravels you. Right? Now, that's, is that myth or fact? You want to live in a world in which you're, you still have glaciers? Those rocks, those Chata de Gaul, are your ancestors. But that means you have to treat them in a certain way. You want to live in a world of melted glaciers, right? In which, in trying to keep the, the snow happening so you can get the economy, you have to suck out more water to make artificial snow. That's fine. But then, <laughs> right? So it tries to upset the whole thing about myth and legend and fable and fact by saying the way you treat someone produces the world you live in, including land, including humans, including it all. And at the same time, um, I don't know, maybe I ask this and then we, we mm. open to the question. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, what I find profoundly very interesting is that there is this constant negotiation of attunement. Mm. Okay. Like yes. so um that hopefully leads to a, a perception of of the the profound relationality and entanglement of 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 vectors that are also physically very far and and in a des disparate way this leads me to a moment to this great talk that you had some months ago mm. in london at goldsmiths for mm. the opening of the carving right. show you were talking with um with Catherine Youssef, and at a certain point, you are speaking about one of the films where there's uh, th the sound of a pelican, oh and yeah. you say, "I don't. Uh, we right. don't care if the audience understands that that is a pelican or not." Um, most you said most people will probably not know that what they're listening to is a pelican. It sounds like a baby crying and another baby crying. <laughs> exactly. yeah. and, and that's not important. And that, that moment for me clicked. Like, at the same time as there is this way of uh, attunement and conversation, and that is interesting, that is curious, there's also a resistance to deliver this performativity of the indigenous that is expected. Oh, yeah, you know? from a carving point. Um, in the sense that the carving are not explaining their condition. They are not delivering a sort of um, um, representation of who they are. The films are, and the images you showed us, which is why they're, they're so hypnotic, because they're, they're layered, no? They're, they're, they're also... Mm. Uh, complex to 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 look at. You're you're covered with other elements of fish and and, and different maps and diagrams and so there is there is a, I would say almost the politics of opacity mm. in which yes there is mm. this position of it's interesting let's let's attune to one another and let's reflect about profound entanglements and at the same time we are not do going to do this expose ourselves our experiences like this in the art that we make. Yeah, you know? that's right, that's right. So, yeah, there's there's that, so in Cotterbing films, and part of this is like, how do we do this? We're kind of making film, we're kind of making installation, I don't know what we're doing. Um, but in Cotterbing films, the image itself, the, 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 the layering of the image itself emerged um, it started, it, the very end of the second film had a little bit, and then really hit in the third film when we just, we got rid of even the little external camera crew. Um, because we had started going around and we noticed that everyone was like past, present, future. Like the untouched past, what part of this film is about that? What part <laughs> is about the present? And what's your view of the future, right? And everyone was just like, where do you think these things are, right? Where do you, and, and we thought there's a moment in it in which you get to past, 
you, sorry, you, uh, you get to the end and Linda Yerwin has found herself in a vortex and she's gone back to old Delisaville, it's the 1950s. Um, and it was a meta commentary on what was going on in the country at the same time. Uh, but anyway, so she ends up going back there and, and of course she's like, she finds the ancestors and she's like having an argument because they're not helping her in the time she's in and they're like, why don't you call out to us since we're still here? Can't you see we're in the ground here? And there's, then the ancestors answer, the, the whole thing starts by saying the ancestor, the ancestors point of view. And it's like what's put in the ground remains in the ground. Right. So history is right here, right? What's, it's here. Right. Now, <laughs> we can't see it, but you could open it up, right? The history is that melting glaciers. That's history right there. Right. The rising tides, that's history. Those seats, like what if I said, like, you know, they're just seats, but what if I said, no, actually that's someone's country. That metal belongs to, oh, I think that metal probably belongs to that mob up by Roper River, probably, who's dug out there. And this heat is probably coming from I forget whose country. What if everything in here, of course, is the actual rearranged relations of many, many, many places? Right? And what if the way you use something depends on how you're related to one or the other of those places? Right? What if, because, you know, I come from Corizolo, then I shouldn't like, be marrying my brother and that's <laughs> my brother's country, I shouldn't sit on it. How would I know, right? How would I know? But that's the kind of problem that really gets presented in, in Cotterbing. And so what we do with our films is we say, these, these history, there isn't history or future, there's the decision about where you take and put things and how in taking and putting you reorganize material leaving some of that material behind usually toxicity in the place you extracted from and take what you think is worthwhile somewhere else and you build up there right. that's that's it's not an archive it's it's in the ground um, and then the question i guess for us is uh who gets to understand those relations when relations themselves have been commodified and racialized, right? So that Cotterbeam films, we, not all the kids know the stories they're telling, but when they watch, they know they're a Cotterbeam film. And so they're competing with each other to guess how the sounds relate to the characters, how the characters relate to this other, this geography that we know is going on in the film, and et cetera. We want them to be figuring it out. If audiences want to figure it out, then they have to go and put some sweat. They have to move their material from the audience back to a carving country, put effort into that country. And if you really go back and you just, and we'll be, everyone's lovely, you agreed to help and do this or that or the other thing, really, not just, not really, like really, then you'd learn, then you would be able to understand, then you'd hear the difference between a baby and a pelican, right? But it has to be in that relational effort. I think this is a great moment to open it up for audience questions. If there are any. Oh, yes, up there, yeah, please. One second, we have microphones coming. Oh. <laughs> I call this project our Moby Dick project because it's like, oh my God, how would you do something like this? No idea. Yeah, anyways. <coughs> it's a somewhat simple, maybe not, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you have many interesting things. It seems like in the story of Italian relationality, yeah. it's very genealogical, mm. but that's not present in the Karabing, uh, 
story of relationality. Mm. So I was I wanted to ask oh, you about your right. thoughts on this question of kith versus kin, you know. Um, it would say it again, it versus like on the question of kith versus kin, like blood uh, yeah. relations, who you can marry versus this other relationality where none of those questions seem to be present. It wasn't about blood relationality. It was In carving side? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, I guess I was uh, also just like, they get that all the time. They just get that, that's just this form of discipline on, on them. But, uh, but that was the other thing that was really when I first, well, when, literally when I sh first showed up in the conversation, and I was like, oh yeah, and of course, you know, we have these different clans, and you, can, you have to you like marry your thing of your thing, but then it people like, you know, and they were like, no, white people marry strangers. It's the weirdest thing. I was like, well, yeah, my dad married a stranger. That's my mom. <laughs> but that was the first stranger. You know, I was just like, rah, rah, rah. And... And, so, and th then they started like saying, oh yeah, well, the way here, how does it work there? The way here it works is that, you know, and then they, you know, the way you connect and the way you connect in marriage um, also, at, it still kind of does, but uh, uh, maps onto country too, because the marriage also creates these, we call them roads. Um, so it creates these roads to different countries because you have to follow, you can't just go somewhere, you have to follow something, right? So you can follow the track of like a fish or, or the track of a, a marriage or a ritual. So I'll tell you, so yes, so no, they're very much there. But they're, again, interestingly, they're not, they're very much not radici, they're not origin, right? They're not what was here first. It's where did it come from? Where did it go? Which way? Which way? Right? Um, and uh, you, 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 pick, you pick it up. You emerge out of, you pick it up, but then it, if you pick up, like a, if you somewhere and something jumps inside and then you're, it's called a Mari, it marks the baby and stuff. Um, well, it puts you into, then it puts you somewhere, but that somewhere is not rooted, it's relational, right? So, so absolutely, blood and, you know, like, desperate time, desperate measures, you can marry your father's, sister's kids, or mother's, brother's kids, but you should not. They're, like, too close. But they're technically marriageable. So, no, there's a lot there, but, but this, the, the, the Vicini is not just we're neighbors in the system, and it's, that's why it's not the same. Like in the Alps, it was e confini. There were borders. It was ours versus theirs. And what's really interesting, if you go back to the archives, this seems kind of interesting. It's interesting. I don't know what to do with it, but it's interesting. Um, you know, as as the as this as this uh, silver floods in from from the assault in the new world, right? It floods in through Naples and th we have price inflation in Europe early on and then the mad dash, mercantile dash, right? To grab raw material wherever you could find it through whatever means, bring it back, add value, sell it back. And that's why the Austrians, they've lost everything. But anyways, um, the population starts going up and the more the population goes up in these hills, the more people are like putting boundaries around there their lands. And in the archive, there's these, there's one moment at least in a couple that I've found, but it's one in particular in which then these disputes happen because the archives are all about eliti. It's all about the, you know, fighting. And the fights are, that's why semi-autonomous because the fights are settled by the, the sovereign out of Trento. And this juridical guy who's solving a fight between Corisolo and Pinzola back in like the 1530s says, you know, what is happening here? These, this, this, these borders, these confini were supposed to create harmony between places. And instead, they're just increasing conflict. And the, the, the legami, the vincoli, the bonds, 
of brotherhood between places are being destroyed. Right. And you have an example of Massimilia, Ma uh, Massimina folks who are being told by Cortisola folks that, that, that that's our mulder, that's our pastor, you can't have that. You, you know, you put your cows here, we get $500 or what, whatever, not $500, but whatever it is. And these poor Massimino folks are like, we're your, like, we're forestieri in the technical sense. We're not the local families that govern it. But we're your brother-in-laws. We've always shared these pastures. Not anymore. Confini, confini. Right? So in that system, it really mattered, like, your roots, right? Like, who was an original family? And who's a stranger? And what's weird now in those areas is that there's still this obsession. So when we, um, Simon Ott said, my grandfather basically pulled out all the Simonas because they were everyone starting death, and the Bruca and Brosi and a lot of the Nellos. Um, so when I first went back or I told them I was there, they were like, oh, the lost Simonas. You know, really weird. I was like, you guys, you're like psycho. But not psycho. But the, so there's this there way in which the Confini, the bound borders, created this fantasy of roots. Right. And Rex Edmonds, again, the one with the fish, was really, you know, we have a film called The Riot, which is kind of tells how Cotterman started. Um, uh, he said something in there that then when he was listening to everyone describe what happened in Cortisolo, he's like, it's the same thing. When Pedagot came here, when we say white people, but we mean settlers, came here, they, they, in the Land Rights Act really made it much worse. They said, okay, this little area belongs to these families. This little area belongs to these families. This, and so they just cut all the we would say legami or vincoli, the ties and obligations between and just severed them into forms of, like I would say this kind of a, a European idea of a commu uh, comuna, right? In which the families decide on a territory which conforms to a proprietary idea, right? And so those relations of marriage and severed and all you get now are these anthropologically bizarre descent groups. Yeah. In which you're always saying, what's my, what's my radity? What's my origin? Yeah. Patrice, please. And then Hiva. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, there, thank you so much. So inspiring. And there's <laughs> putting side by side these, yeah. you know, these, the, mm. what we see as our heritage, you know, of yeah. white European American, yeah. and so on versus, you know, a culture that you really have gone in to understand and, and see their differences. And I really love that you finished up, you, you know, towards the end of your uh, talk, you started saying, um, you know, questioning the notion of there's this myth. Uh, and yeah, that's, fact. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I mean, yeah. quite frankly, you know. All right, so the... I would, I, you know, I'd like to suggest that getting beyond this is mm. not, you know, you've used the word relation, relational, mm. it's a relationship mm. between us and us. I mean, that's where the problem begins, that we mm. see ourselves distinct from each other, mm. right? So therefore, we have to have a relationship in order to combine or to connect, whereas the Aboriginals do not see themselves as distinct from each other, mm -hmm. or even distinct from the land. The, the land, yes, you, we, we call it ancestral, or they call it ancestral, because that's a, one of our words. They ancestrally use. present, ancestrally ongoing. It, which it's during, just yeah, one of our yeah, words yeah, they yeah, use. But yeah. you know, when you really listen to them talk about it for a long time, it is them, right? We, they, are, they, they are not rooted in the land. They are the roots of the land because we are all just, we come to be in order to look after the land. The responsibility is to go on 
and you know, and the way they transverse the land is to sustain themselves, but also care for it. Hmm. You know, their responsibility for caring for right. the land right. is far more, uh, in, you know, significant, and we've got a lot to learn from that. Um, and so, um, you know, then so then we start to say, uh, if um, you know, and in fact, in you know, in Western culture, even in Christianity, we say dust to dust. Mm. Mm. I mean, we—that's exactly mm. what we mean. Mm. We come from there, we go back to there. Mm. So you know, they're way ahead of us in terms of understanding our existence in the world, and they see the coexistence of everything, the coexistence of, of them and the land, rather than a distinction, and therefore the need for a relation, a relationship, and therefore the need for possession and dispossession, and so on. And this is, you know, this is sort of partially why I, I think they sort of get so confronted with our notion of, you know, what's your achievement versus mine, mm. and mm. so on. And, and so therefore, you know, I think, um, what, <laughs> sorry, what I want to ask is if you would speak a little bit about, you know, how we, it's not they, it's not they mm. who needs to change and, yep. and understand, it's, it's we. So how can we get inside that head? I mean, I've lived in Australia all my life and I've, mm. you know, mm. had a lot of experience learning mm. this and, mm. and so on and it's still hard to get. But how can we, because we're never going to solve mm. the problems of our warring and our, you know, possession and so mm. on, mm. Um, the way mm. we are. Mm. You know, the uh, very rich comment question. Katabing's always been very clear that um, there are, are different, it's this phrase, and again, it's, it's a phrase, um, same, different different same right and but both sides are really important it's like and you know, if Angelina Lewis was here she's very articulate she's very about this point in, um, in the way her father is related to this one area in over in Arnhem Land and mother over on our side very different there the the modes of ritual are very different but there's the same like yeah okay same sweat, but they're different, and we try and hold. So yeah, so so it's it's both of those. Also, relationality is different. So for instance, um, and I'm sorry, I'm the only one here tonight. But but the 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 Mundy story, the Bear Mundy story. It's not a story. The the Bear Mundy geography. Let's put it that way. Um, uh, is just one of many overlapping geographies, but it's really, I think, important because um, the relation, the relations and differences are what constitute the difference in the relations. And it just sounds like a loopity loop, but it, all of them are important because the, the two sisters f are fighting they're not like peaceful harmony. I mean, if everyone's laughing, they're like, well, you know, people think of peace and harmony. We're just always fighting. And it's like, yeah, I know. T but they're, they're bickering. You know, if you, we always say, what were they, the young people say, what were they bickering about? And the older people, we say, well, probably, you know, brothers, because two sisters can marry the same guy. So they're probably bickering about that. And, and so their difference, they come to agree that they should go separate. And in going separate, they go to, they create different geographies as they remain there doing that thing. And so the, the difference cr created the relations between these two places, right? But you can't have the relation between two places unless you have the differences. So, but difference is not a problem. So what's the problem, right? It's, why do we think difference is a problem? Why do I have to get under difference and find the commonality, right? Well, that idea emerges out of Europe in the long history of justifying why it is that you can go in and terrorize and steal from other people. 
Why can we do this? They're different. In what way? Are they the same or are they different? Because if they're different, we can just destroy them. Do, do non-human animals have, are they like us or not like us in terms of language and mind? If they have language and mind, they're like us and therefore we can't just murderize them. What about rocks? Are they like us or not like this? Do they have language and mind? If they don't, can we just destroy them? What? I, I'm trying to make it sound crazy because it is crazy that if you, if the, if the other, whether it's a human or not, is not like you, then no ethics, no politics, no, you can just destroy it. What is this? Right? And then the way you keep from destroying the other is you say, you're the same as me. That was the Land Rights Act. That's the politics of recognition, of liberal recognition. Okay, we can't destroy you anymore because now you realize you're like us. You have your own culture, but you still have a hierarchy because we have the fat culture and you have the myth culture, right? So this is the, the what Natchi said to Cousin Evo, Cousin Evo, I told Evo I was gonna talk about it tonight. What, what Natchi said to Evo was really great because, and then Evo was like, oh yeah, right, right. Why am I doing that? What happens if I don't do that, i.e., what happens if I don't say this is a myth or a fable, but is an actual relation? What I mean by that is not, you get out of, is it a fact, is it a myth? You say, what happens? What world is produced? What things are possible? What things are not possible? If that is a chat de Gaulle, you do not climb on it. If you do not climb on it, there's no income from rock climbers. If there's no income from rock climbers, well, guess what? The right to be comfortable starts changing. The relational right to be comfortable starts changing. Yeah. Since we have, we're running out of time, but we have one more question from Hiba, I propose. Um. Uh, thank you so much. This was great. A uh, lot of things to think about. Uh, I just had a, a question that has, I mean, I don't know how it's gonna come across, but it's a political question or the implications for the politics. Yeah. So if I'm going to take the question of Europeans uh, or people from Italy or Austria looking for, like saying that they have the relationship with the mountain yeah. as a way to argue that, to, because this is, they're using indigeneity as a way to stop the idea of new immigrants coming over yes. and taking over. Yes, good. <laughs> you yes. want to finish it? <laughs> yes. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. This is exactly it. This is why yeah. this is just really has to be pushed against. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but then how can you stop white folks from taking that kind of discussion and telling indigenous people, yeah. listen, we are now in a capitalist economy, so you might as well want to live with that and think about new relationalities because this is what you're asking of us, of thinking of something because the economy is a relation, so you're saying you, if you want to climb the mountain as a fable, but you're making it an economy, I'm not sure I want that kind of relationship, but this is the present we're living in. So how can you stop this from going back and going to saying, you can't ask me for reparations oh, because yeah. I live yeah. now, right now on that land, and you yeah. might as well want to think of new relations of that. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? No, I do, but, that, but the, the, the temporality, I would say, is off because they're already doing that over there. That is in, sorry, in settler colonies like Australia, they're already saying, if you want to live, not live well, if you want to just live past 50, you have to understand that this was the big thing that happened in 2007. You have to agree that your relation to country is myth mythological. And therefore, can be. It's just a but, myth. But even if it's not a methodological method, even if it's not yeah. a myth. I'm sorry, and I know. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Even if it's not a myth, even if I believe that the yeah. the, the, the fable is not a fable, and that yeah, yeah. my ancestors are in the mountains, and yeah. I do believe uh, my the creation of of a way of thinking about country that is my country. But if yeah. I'm telling people right now, if I'm telling people in Europe right now, you cannot claim that kind of indigeneity or history. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, I think Then I, I can go back to the indigenous okay. people and say Sorry. you cannot claim your land for yeah. reparations. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, so yes. Sorry. No, 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 it's really, it's really an important question. And I think there are, there are, 
one of the things that got me like going, what is going on when I was going around Europe was a couple, and I'm gonna get to it, a couple things. Um, one is that on the left is very strong support of you know, indigenous um, um, struggles in the context of settler colonialism. Um, on the other, very anti, uh, in some quarters an anti belonging to anywhere in particular, because that's very close to fascism for a lot in Europe. It's like, it's just, your, your hair get up, your hair gets up. Um, and then this, then this movement toward commons, the re, reconstitute the commons. Okay. So why, why do I say, look, you know, in, in a flippant kind of way, and I apologize, I say if anyone could be indigenous, white indigenous to a place, I mean, voila, we came from there. Right. And, and look at the, this kind of things that one can do by saying like Chateau de Gaulle and stuff like that. Okay. But I firmly say, no, don't say that. Don't say indigenous from Cortisola. Why? Because indigenous settler is a uh, discursive relation that emerged as these ships created connections by literally moving people here. So, you know, it's like a shield. The great repopulation, moving people here, forcing people there, massacring there, pulling up material, hauling it back, leaving the pollution behind. That's what indigenous means. Indigenous is a relation to settler colonialism. In, in let's say, Povinelli relation to cortisol. Unless you just ignore that it's, you know, in a phenomenon way, it is in a colonial relation. You'd have to ignore that to say it's indigenous. I'm not sure if I can, you see what I'm, that's why. So it's like, I don't care how far down the root goes, the radici, the route is what creates indigenous settler relations. And thus, it's a perversion to, to, for me to go, I'm indigenous, it's like, and again, a lot of suffering, a lot of everything, but no, absolutely not. And not only did it start like that, but it continues. It's just the same thing over and over. I think we can. Did, am I, did I at least no. understand what you're asking me? Okay, <laughs> okay. I think, I think we can stop there. Please join me in thanking Elizabeth and Philippa for this incredible, um, incredible talk. Um, I want to remind everyone that the next and, and, and last affirmation for now will be um, uh, April 3rd on a Wednesday. Um, we'll have Jack Halberstam, Paul Preciado, and Marquise Bay here on the stage. <laughs> See you then.